So decimation of a platoon. Here we go after all that lead up. Whew, I hope I don't let you down. Decimation of a platoon. That distant ostinato is the mournful bastinado. Cold deserter soldiers beaten by their brothers in retreat. Count off by ten. Groups of men, count off, count off. Groups of ten, groups of ten, all ran across a frozen fen away from fire. Shortest straw, the shortest one in ten, tied and taken to the glen. One in ten, one in ten, one in ten. What was wrong we did? We ran. But instead of all of us, now just one in ten. We ran. Aren't we all alive on borrowed time before we catch a bullet, fall in slime along the road or sink in fen, twist a bit, expire? We ran, ten in ten. We ran. 10 in 10, bludgeoned with sticks in the butt end of weapons, slowly, mutely, blow by blow, arms and legs ballooning black and blue, churm of blood, <clears throat> painful screams and twisted gasping through the silent shame and kindling, 9 in 10 who bring their cudgels down. Comrades, comrades. A stretto of thump upon thump, clout upon clout, one in ten, one in ten. Comrades, comrades. That distant ostinato is the mournful bastinado, fallen brothers beating fallen brothers. So the next poem is called <clears throat> Standing Under Sky and Over Earth. And the problem I have reading this is it's one sentence. So let's see if I can do it. Standing Under Sky and Over Earth. Enlightenment is not as blissful as the Buddha says. Oneness with the world is also oneness with its pain. Unless I haven't really reached that state of grace. But it feels so real, so real. It feels so here and now in this, fractured, in this fractured second just before my death, which comes the moment all this talking ceases, all these jumpers screaming into ever present now as they tumble through the air to gravid earth and catch blunt glimpses of an ancient weathered wall pockmarked by arrows, contemplating black-soaked sky and thermal plains that meet the distant clouds somewhere farther than the eye can see, beyond the sea whose surface turmoil echoes over rocks, but underneath are creatures making light in water's gelid shaft of darkness. On a track I used to run my haptic maneuvers, eyes closed through a sleep of reason, easy love and crowded mementos of wise men consulting with smoke and all that blah, blah, blah the Buddha likes to say. So much a fickle wind, so much the girl who drugged me with the dizzy vision of an end to craving, so much the night we dreamed we pierced each other's dream. I into hers, her into mine, and we missed each other. We should have dreamed as one and in one dream at the same time. And the time after that reminds me of the day I parted from her for the war. A week or two at most, about to last a life. Embraced, we traced a flight of golden leaf, its brief ascent, its, long, its languid glide to frozen pond falling freely at just as jumpers do into the pain of persistent mediocrity, theirs and mine, and both in flight again towards home, expecting welcome from the mountains of my childhood coming into view, changeless like the dead, my childhood's patchwork slopes of green and brown then black, then white dissolving in gray of sky above the twisting specks and dotted arrows swarming ever closer, 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 never touching, never touched. Okay, I'm going to read one more poem. 
and it's a poem about organ transplantation. It's called, My Brother Still Runs Like Rain. My brother still runs like rain. My brother's bones and kidneys must be walking somewhere now, transplanted into other men, perhaps in steady rain the hour before the sunrise. Each raindrop holds the water molecules of former living things now decomposed, transformed to ice and steam, then cloud. Soon former raindrops walk the city streets. Soon future raindrops step between the fallen branches over muddy cracks. Raindrops somewhere in the world once formed my brother's water base and Pascal's too, centuries past. And yet this rain is not the same as them. Insensate liquid fall, just bounce and pool, cover, spread, run in rivers at the curb, like my brother used to run at dawn, bare-chested, under buds of water clinging to the limbs of leafless trees, through umber streets, counting footsteps, leaping over puddles, chased by clouds that promise downpour any minute now. Thanks. Now, if you guys want to ask some questions, or otherwise, we'll just call it a day. What's that? Okay, this is very interesting. It's a very good question. I start off with, you know, I uh, I know iambic and I know trochaic, but sometimes I get confused to the names of the others. So the beginning of Karst vision starts off with the stress, unstress, unstress, stress, unstress, unstress. And then after that, it becomes iambics and trochaics. And an iambic is unstress, stress. A trochaic is the opposite, stress, unstress. And the iambic trochaic system, of course, is the major system in the English language. But does, any, does anyone remember, Kathy? Do you remember what the? But I do work in it. And what you'll notice is that a lot of times, I'll get a meter pattern, but I'll have irregular phrasing for it. And then I'll change the meter. And uh, often, I'll change the meter to change the mood. But it's a very good question, because we do start off with a stressed, unstressed, unstressed system, and then we go to the iambic system, and then go back again at that key moment. Um, and in fact, let me get it, and I'll, because it is kind of interesting. Oh, here we go. So we start off, lightning incises the belly of night and the hillside ignites and collapses. You see, you've got this, yes, the dactyl, right. And then we get to blurry shadows, moles and dormice start through scrub from plain to scrawny pine. So then we return to the uh, uh, iambic, trochaic, but it's not that iambic pentameter that you hear in Shakespeare or in sonnets or in Tennyson, but an irregular. <coughs> And that irregularity is the source of uh, so much of the music that you hear in my poetry by setting up this, uh, this meter but using it irregularly. But then we get to the key moment where he's away from his sleeping Conrads and he's going to have his dream of his home. He's going to see his home, a vision of his home, across this desolate landscape of war. And so we briefly, in a way to jolt the 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 listener, uh, we briefly go back to the dactylic system. He squats inside his tent, away from sleeping comrades, conjures a vision that never transforms into dream. Little jolt, but stands before him full of secret niches draining karst-like hope. And if you look at my poem carefully, you see that a lot of times I'll set up one metric system in an irregular jazz-like fashion and then intrude with another one. So I hope that didn't bore you guys, that long answer there. But it's a good question, because I did really pay careful attention in that case, at least. Some other questions? OK. Well, this was great. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.